five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey, space enthusiasts. My guest this week is Austin Link, a co-founder of Starfish Space. Starfish develops a space tug, and we will explain what that is, which can be used for satellite life extension and space debris removal. Austin and his co-founder Trevor both came out of Blue Origin, and now they are well on their way at Starfish, which successfully raised the seed round last year. Please enjoy listening to their story. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out, and also check out my episode with the CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. And just some final things before we start the episode about ourselves. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. If you want us help, expand our work, you can do so and support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. And we'll also put that link in the episode notes. And lastly, you can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Hello, space enthusiasts. It's time for another episode. And after a couple of non-business episodes, which I really hope you enjoyed, it's time for a regular business episode again, which means we are interviewing the founder of an interesting space company. And this week, this is going to be Austin Link, the CEO and co-founder of Starfish Space. Welcome, Austin. Thanks, Raphael. Good to be here and good to be recording. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that. So let's start as usual. Um, can you give us, please, the elevator pitch on Starfish Space? Yeah, so the, the quick overview, uh, my co-founder Trevor and I, we left Blue Origin about three years ago now to start Starfish Space. We are developing the Otter, which is a satellite servicing vehicle, which is designed to do two missions. One is to extend the life of geostationary satellites, and the second is to dispose of satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, we've been fortunate to have some early success in developing technologies and building a team and raising some capital and building a customer base. We still have a long and challenging road ahead of us to be able to really uh, deploy and, and operate the, these otters and to do so at scale in a way that justifies a venture-backed business. Um, and we've, uh, we're have we spending a lot of our time right now developing the rendezvous proximity operations and docking technology that is uh, challenging to do on orbit and really opens up the the broad sort of satellite servicing business cases we're looking at it. Okay, and we'll delve into all of that, but I have to ask you, uh, Starfish, uh, Otter, where, where are those names coming from? <laughs> Starfish Space. So um, when you have a couple engineers try to name something, uh, you usually end up with a spreadsheet. And so we have a spreadsheet from long ago that has... Uh, a couple dozen different names that Trevor and I were considering. Um, and at the end of the day, we settled on Starfish Space. And it actually wasn't a very close decision because we think the starfish represents a unique connection between humans and the Earth and space around us. The idea that somebody long ago pointed at this little creature in the sea and says, I think that this looks just like those big burning balls of gas up in the sky, um, that's really... I think represents a very uh, sort of deep fascination with with how humans see the world and what humans are interested in in the world. Um, and to us, that connection between Earth and between space is, is why you go to space. And, and we felt that Starfish Space was a, a great name that helped represent that, that connection. Mm -hmm. um, and it has some alliteration too, which doesn't hurt. Gotcha. How about the other... Oh, and then the otter. So after after about a year as starfish, I uh, we had uh, Jen had joined our team, and she was helping us do some of the marketing communications. And 
She said, you know, we really need to name this servicing vehicle that you're developing. We go, okay, sounds good. Um, and again, we we came up with a, a broad set of names and at the core of them, and maybe at the core of how we do Starfish Space, we're incredibly fortunate to get to work in the space industry and to get to spend every day thinking about a future that's that's worth pursuing and a future that's worth dreaming about. Uh, it's it's incredibly exciting and we're incredibly fortunate. And we think as part of that, really need to take the time to enjoy and to have fun and appreciate it while you're doing it. And so we had a lot of names that we liked because they were cute or because they were funny or because they fit with the starfish theme. Um, and in the end, we said, all right, who wouldn't want to go to otter space? Uh, and so we have the otter. <laughs> That's awesome. Out of space. I love that. So, and, and, and I know you have some sort of cute sort of like uh, pictograms of this in your, in your pitch, uh, pitch tag as well. <laughs> so many little, uh, little sea creature graphics. Yeah. Know, it's, it's, it's the cute, it's the cute space company. I like the it. The cute space company. I'll take that one. That, could, that, that, that could be like a slogan. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, also, but more generally talking beyond names, I mean, so you guys with Blue Origin, that's one of the most prominent space companies, obviously lots of interesting things going on there from building big rockets to lunar programs to other things, uh, rocket yeah. engines, including for other people. Um, so that's not a bad place to be uh, for engineers. Um, you guys nevertheless decided to kind of embark on the entrepreneurial journey, a journey that Elon Musk has famously recently compared to eating glass, um, which doesn't <laughs> seem to be a very good thing to do. Um, why did you guys decide to do that? Um, you know, first I'll say Blue Origin really was a great place to be. Um, I, as a, an engineer there for several years, boy, I just got to work with incredibly capable people that I really had a, a great time working with and that I learned a ton from. Um, so that was that was a, a great experience for me. And then the other thing that I think Blue Origin does very well is what an inspiring vision to be to be working towards. I mean, it's it's what well, we're all working towards in one way. But uh, millions of people living and working in space. I was really excited to be working towards that. And and in a way, I really excited to I am really excited to still be working towards it. Um, so Blue Origin was great. And so then you have a lot of activation energy to get yourself to go do something else. Uh, and what got Trevor and I really excited and got us to branch off and do our things. And I'll say for reference, we we worked pretty closely together at, at Blue mm -hmm. Origin, um, which is one of the things I'm always very thankful for on this is to be able to have Trevor as a co-founder, somebody mm -hmm. who is a close friend and who I we knew we worked well together ahead of time, and and Trevor's just brilliant. Uh, is is the only thing that even gives us a chance in all of this having a co-founder like Trevor. Um, but we ended up venturing off on our own for for really two primary reasons, and then one last piece of reasoning. Uh, so first, we looked around us. And we saw a lot of space startups that were going on and that were kind of succeeding or that were going well. Um, and it was more than just Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. It was uh, folks like Rocket Lab or Planet or Made in Space or Relativity or what was then Analytical Space and is now Hedron. We were seeing some of these companies in various stages and going, whoa, you can actually do this. And if you do it, you can have a huge lever arm to change how humans operate in space. And we happen to be at a point in our careers, in our lives, where that was a very appealing thing for us to try to do. Um, the other thing was, uh, as we thought about the space industry, we got very excited at the potential for satellite servicing and maybe more broadly OSAM or ISAM or whatever the acronym of the day is that represents you know, the capabilities that you can have if you can reliably and safely and affordably interact with objects in space. Um, and and we recognize, boy, if you can start doing these satellite servicing missions, then, then this is a new paradigm for how you go out into the universe. And someday when people are, are building power stations or manufacturing plants or, or O'Neill cylinders out on orbit, those are all going to be done building upon the same technologies that we developed for life extension and debris removal now. Uh, so those two things got us really excited about the journey. Um, and then there was one last step because the other side of this is 
you you go and you look at your bank account and you go, huh, I'm not going to be making any money for a while. I wonder how this is going to go. Um, and you have to parse through and do the math and be responsible to yourself. Can we go do this? Uh, but we also stepped back and said, when you look back in 10 years, what are you going to say thinking back on this journey and this decision? And we said, if, if you're working with somebody that you know you work well with, the worst case scenario is you go out, you try to start a company for a year, you never make any money, you meet a lot of interesting people, you learn a lot of really interesting things, you learn about a lot about yourself. And, and 10 years from now, you look back on it, and how could that not be more valuable than, than another year of working at the same company? Um, and, and so that was the final question. I'm like, hey, we know each other well enough that we know that we're not going to just in three months be sitting on the couch watching Netflix and not actually working towards mm -hmm. it. Um, and so as long as we really work towards it, given where we were in life at the time, we said, this is this is really a no loss scenario and an incredible potential positive. Yeah, no, I hear you. Let me ask you sort of another couple of questions on sort of like the um, that decision and Blue Origin, and then we'll, we'll delve into what uh, Starfish is actually doing in technology yeah. and markets and all of that. But so Blue Origin, because it is such a prominent space company, argu arguably um, uh, besides SpaceX, the most prominent quote unquote new space company, mm -hmm. though I increasingly hate that, that word new space, I don't know what it means. <laughs> Um, anything particular that you would highlight about the culture there? So like, you know, what I mean by that is sometimes of like, you know, SpaceX, for example, people would highlight things like, you know, like uh, fast iteration, like no fear of failing, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, starting from first principles, that type of thing. Anything, you know, similar you would like to highlight from your Blue Origin experience that you took along and that may help you in your journey? Um, without trying to comment too much, I'll say one thing that uh, one thing that resonated well with me that has at times been a key part of the Blue Origin approach is um, at, at times Blue Origin has been very good about uh, trying to let some of the progress and some of the development speak for itself. Um, and I think that the early New Shepard program was an example of uh, a a vehicle that that was sort of getting attention at the same time that it was doing the mission um and i thought that uh i thought that that was a really exciting approach as i was joining blue origin um and it's it can be really easy in the space industry to make big promises and and struggle to deliver on them and 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 all everybody struggles to deliver and everything is late in our industry that's the way it is uh but but i think that there are some people who and and, and I know SpaceX does this well, and Rocket Lab even had an advertising campaign around it on on really focusing on their ability to do the things that they say they're going to do. Um, and and I thought and and still think that that there are many ways in which Blue Origin does that, uh, and that I hope has lasted for us here at at Starfish Space. That you always have to get out and talk a little bit about what you're trying to do, but I hope that we do so in a in a realistic manner, and then we recognize internally that that it's really challenging to deliver deliver on actually building a satellite servicing vehicle that's actually going to provide a lot of value for our customers. Uh, and that's really where our energy and our focus is. Yeah, Sp space, as they say, is hard. And then the final question I'll try to ask you about Blue Origin is, I mean, there's now some prominent sort of uh, startups that have come out of Blue Origin, right? I mean, just off the top of my head, obviously, Relativity Space and then... Um, uh, also Stoke Space. Mm -hmm. is, is there something now that uh, like you would consider a quote unquote Blue Origin Mafia or whatever you would call it, like the PayPal Mafia, <laughs> where you guys, are you guys kind of keeping in touch, talking to each other, helping each other out? Is, is, does that community exist? Um, the community does exist to a certain degree. Uh, and and there's interestingly, there are founders that come out of Blue Origin and end up in the space industry. And then there are founders that come out of Blue Origin and go into slightly different industries. Hmm. Um, but I think that to me, it speaks to just the, the the talent that was and is at Blue Origin. Um, and and I know a lot of folks at Blue Origin and put effort into to developing that talent and developing people over a long time. And I, I think it has uh, in many ways paid off for the company and, and paid off for the space industry as some of us move on to other companies. Makes sense. Makes sense. OK, cool. So let's talk a little about uh, actually what Starfish does. Um, yeah. So you mentioned two markets, life extension and debris removal, both, I think, very interesting. So mm -hmm. why don't we start with life extension? So do you want to little, talk a little bit about your vision for that market, where it is right now, where it might go? I mean, people may be aware 
listeners, there is um, you know, something called the mission extension vehicle mm -hmm. that exists that is doing life extension, but it isn't really much beyond that, I think. Um, so yeah, why don't you talk us through how you see the market there? Yeah, so one, I'll talk broadly about satellite servicing here, and then I'll lead into kind of life extension and the degree removal. Uh, satellite servicing is something that people have recognized the potential of for a long time. Uh, NASA did the first satellite servicing mission in the 1980s. They visited the Hubble to upgrade it and repair it several different times. Um, problem is, each time it was a space shuttle full of astronauts, it cost over a billion dollars to do. And it's tough to take these capabilities out into the commercial realm at a cost like that. Why would you pay a billion dollars to get a little bit more out of a satellite that cost half a billion dollars? Um, so we think that part of the key to really unlock in these markets to be able to do things uh, and provide value for customers is to be able to do these missions in an affordable manner. Um, and then uh, maybe some of the first steps there uh, Northrop Grumman deserves a lot of credit for what they're doing with the mission extension vehicle right now. They are extending two satellites on orbit. Uh, for a single satellite, they're getting paid $65 million over a five-year period. Those are, uh, it's it's really impressive by them. I think that there's been maybe some some difficulties in in how do you get the, the business case to scale. And we have a couple of things that we think enables the business case to scale because at the end of the day, there's over 500 geostationary satellites on orbit. Um, and if you're talking doing life extension, which is where, and maybe I should get a little more into what the mission actually is here. The, the mission itself is as a large geostationary satellite. And uh, the example that I use when talking to folks in the U.S. is is direct TVs, a satellite that uh, is broadcasting or relaying information to, to folks. Um, that satellite has something like a 10 to 15 year lifetime. And then its life often has to end because it's out of onboard propellant. It takes propellant to keep that slot in geostationary orbit. A mission like what we're doing with the Otter, like the mission extension vehicle, comes and straps onto the satellite at the end of life. And helps keep it in that orbital slot beyond when it otherwise would have run out of propellant. And you can add another, say, five years of life onto these satellites. That's a mission, then, that you're adding a significant lifetime onto these capital-intensive assets can be a lot of value. That's why uh, Northrop's getting paid the $65 million for a single satellite. And you can imagine with over 500 satellites in geostationary orbit, if that's what you can get for one satellite, it's a large potential market out there. Um, and it's a it's a potential market that is, is not broadly addressed right now, but but there is a, a generally relatively clear understanding of the value and of the the rough price points that people are talking about, um, and it's a it's a market that you can see as being generally uh, well understood because a lot of the folks that should be servicing over the next 10 to 15 years are in fact already in space and operating. Yeah. So in your case and in Northrop's case, right, that's basically um, attaching a new propulsion unit, so to say, right? There's, yeah, also a lot of yeah. talk, there's also a lot of talk these days about sort of, um, of just refueling satellites. Is that somewhere in the landscape as well, or is that not relevant because um, uh, because you cannot actually sort of like um, retroactively make like refuel these satellites because they were they weren't designed to be refueled? Yeah, uh, you know, refueling is an exciting technology and capability, um, and and I know there are folks working on it, and and we're hoping that it goes well for them. In many ways, it's something that um, could even be useful for a vehicle like ours. The mm -hmm. the the challenge when you're looking at satellites that are up there is satellites that are already on orbit are in fact designed to make it very difficult to take the fueling port off because you don't want it to accidentally come off during launch. Right. Um, and and the it, it's just too complex to really be feasible to refuel satellites as they currently are built on orbit. Um, and that means that for these satellites, which represent the, the next 15 years of geostationary satellites that will reach the end of their life, the ones that are already on orbit, uh, refueling just isn't really an option for. 
Um, and then, and then, in many ways, the life extension mission can provide basically the same value as as, as many of the refueling options um, as as we see even the longer term market developing. Understood. And so, you mentioned sixty five million for um, for the you know for Grumman mission extension vehicle. Do you guys have a notion yet of sort of like at least magnitude wise where you guys might come in? We do have a notion, Raphael, and that's all I got for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the notion being clearly much cheaper, I would. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, so let's talk about um let's talk about debris removal. That's also like very interesting. Lots of talk about it. Um there is um I think there's at least a couple of missions basically um you know being sponsored by space agencies. Um we have one here in Europe where led by ASA, right, to take out a mm -hmm. uh, Uh, mm -hmm. the second stage of a rocket, um, which is going to be led by a Swiss startup called ClearSpace. Now, one question I always, or the first question as an investor I always have about that is, um, so this is also something that's not cheap to do. I don't think it's the 65 million, but, you know, numbers I keep on hearing is something like, well, something like 5 million to remove one piece of debris. And the question is, if you don't get like somebody nice like ESA to pay for it, who's going to pay for it? And why who's would they Who's going to pay for, for it? it? Why would anybody yeah. clear up it's this like, it's like, the, it's like the oceans, right? It's like Like the orbit is like the ocean. It's like this like common good that everybody is basically polluting at the moment, sadly. Yeah. So I'll say one uh, shout out to Clear Space, exciting company doing cool things. Also, anytime you talk about doing this as a business, you should give credit to Astroscale, a Japanese company yeah, that has really sure. um, helped pioneer the idea that this could be a business. Uh, and, and I think both of them at least think about the life extension market too. Um, the challenge, as a lot of people see it, is hey, sure, I can see how space debris as you launch more and more stuff is a problem, but isn't it a tragedy of the commons problem where everybody has a little bit of satellites in space and nobody feels the pain fully on themselves and therefore nobody's really incentivized to go remove the trash. Uh, and a lot of folks then jump to kind of a regulatory solution on, well, we're going to have to have rules that force people to remove their trash. And that's where sort of mm -hmm. the business case comes from. And there are regulatory guidelines that maybe encourage it in some ways. And the FCC just announced they're thinking about and, yeah. and the FCC for, for international folks is, is the US body that sort of governs satellite communications mm -hmm. and through that has some degree of governing how satellites operate. And it, and, and it, they just announced that they're doing a, they're considering switching to a five-year deorbit timeline mm -hmm. instead of a 25-year deorbit timeline, which, which would be a good thing. Space is getting a lot more use than it was 20 years ago when people started talking about 25 years. Um, but the we see a unique incentive set emerging as more and more folks launch their satellites in large constellations. Because when you put a 100 or even a 1,000 satellites in a single orbit, then when your satellite dies and it's floating through the orbit, it's not really a tragedy of the commons problem anymore. It's your problem. You've put billions of dollars of infrastructure in space that is central to the core of your business. And, and having, a, having a dead satellite float through that is potentially an existential hazard to the rest of your constellation uh, is, is a major risk. Um, and so that's the incentive that we see that we're hearing from customers. And that leads to then the constellation operator One, they're going to be incentivized to try to dispose of these satellites themselves, and that's what they should do. Mm -hmm. um, and then some portion of them just aren't going to be successful in doing it themselves. And that's where we'll show up and help them dispose of the ones that can't dispose of themselves. Um, and so that's the... That's the core business case as we see it. Now, if you look at some Soviet upper stage from the 1970s that's sitting in a 900 kilometer altitude orbit, uh, that is also a potential risk for many satellites. It's a pain yeah. in the butt to try to operate around and try to dodge. I don't know who's going to pay you to deorbit that upper stage from 50 years ago. I, in fact, don't even know if people are going to let you deorbit it. Um, there are, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of complications that come in there. Uh, and so that's, that's not what we're building our business case around. We really build our business case around being the, the disposal for satellites in particular that are in these larger constellations. Yeah. So for either one of those two use cases, live extension, debris removal, um, basically your potential customers, you mentioned already are like you know, constellation operators. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you and Trevor are basically two aerospace engineers, um, mm -hmm. the potential 
customers here, you're talking about, well, I think by and large, larger companies, more hierarchical levels, uh, the people who you know take the decision of whether to buy the service or not is it's very much a business decision, even though, of course, they'll you know hopefully talk to the engineers and make sure the technology checks out. Um, how has that experience been for you guys as engineers to try to you know get into those companies and and, and sell <laughs> sell your future product? It's uh, it's a super hard thing to to learn how to do all aspects of a business, right? Um, somebody told me when I I was setting out and and we were setting out to start Starfish here. I was talking to a friend who was a serial founder, and they said, oh, Austin, you need to know if you're going to do this, you need to know that engineers make the worst founder. And I was like, what are you talking about? I know how to actually build this. He says, no, you guys, you get a little bit of money, you work away building something cool, and then you run out of money and it's done. And you never built a product that people want to buy and you never sold it to people. Uh, and that at the end of the day is the, the core of the business, right? You have to build a product that yeah. you sell to customers yeah. in a famous, way. That, famous product market fit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's been, a, that's been a learning experience for us. And we've been fortunate to have a lot of great help from a lot of great folks and great programs along the way. And, and you're Prime example of that, Raphael, is we went through uh, Creative Destruction Labs. Oh, yeah. um, you were one of our mentors there and, and helped us understand some of the non-engineering aspects of the business. Uh, and then as we went out to talk to the customers, we said, okay, we need to talk to them. One thing that I didn't appreciate is how early that you can really have conversations if you're just being honest with folks about it. If mm -hmm. we go out on week two and try to sell somebody the honor, they'll say, no, I don't want to buy this year in week two. But if you go out in week two and say, hey, help me understand, I want to do something that can help you. I'm thinking something in this area can help you. Uh, you know, How do you think about this? What actually could be helpful? What would you want us to do? And and, and people want somebody who can help them. And, uh, and, and they'll be helpful in the process. And in fact, people sometimes go out of their way to be helpful to entrepreneurs in the process because mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of folks who are just really supportive of entrepreneurship in the ecosystem, which is amazing. Um, and we were fortunate to have some of those early conversations and you try to have those conversations with a bunch of folks. And really early on, we recognized, wow, when we have conversations with the engineering team, uh, we have great conversations with the engineering team, but we don't always have great conversations with the people that aren't the engineering team. Um, and we had to learn a little bit and we had to expand our uh, our vocabulary and how we thought about things. And, and we still need to. Um, and and now we're finding that, that at a lot of these organizations uh, were, were able to engage and, and understand much better the perspective of, of the folks who will be making a lot of these decisions. And I'll say to many of these organizations' credit, um, in, in many aspects of the decisions around surrounding even the use of a service like ours, um, do heavily involve uh, very capable engineers or, or folks with that engineering knowledge. Yeah, gotcha. I can see that. So let's change tack a little bit and talk a little bit about the technology part, um, mm -hmm. which... which I don't now know you're how, talking to how much you can talk about it without giving away your secret sauce, but to yeah. the extent you can talk about it, right? So for either one of the things you're doing, right, I guess, um, what are the relevant hard things? I suspect it's it's what's what we call RPOD, right, which uh, for our non-technical listeners is, is rendezvous, proximity operations, and, and docking, basically being able mm -hmm. to approach an object in space, uh, cooperative or uncooperative, and dock with it. Is, is, is that the hardest part? And if so, how are you guys thinking about it to the extent you can talk about it? How are you guys solving it? How does it compare to current state of the art? Yeah, um, that definitely is the hardest part, or or maybe more appropriately put, that's the hardest part that that doesn't have clear solutions out there. Mm. Um, you know, getting yourself launched to orbit is really hard, but there are people who build launch vehicles, and getting satellites that operate in orbit is really hard, but there are people who build satellite satellites, and building thrusters is really hard, but there are people who build thrusters. Uh, there are not widely used proximity operations and docking tools out there. Um, and, and that's fine. That's our, that's really where our backgrounds and our expertise is. And in fact, uh, Trevor got his PhD in satellite proximity operations. Um, and it's so great. So this is what we need to develop 
to be able to bring the otter at, to fruition and to be able to provide value to folks with it. Um, so that's where a lot of our focus has been. We're a team that has a lot of uh, guidance, navigation, control, a lot of autonomy software background. And there's a little bit of hardware for how do you actually hold on to the satellite. Um, and and our approaches uh, really rely heavily on the autonomy aspect of it. And our approaches try to be um, efficient in how we use hardware on the vehicle so that uh, so that we can do these missions with a smaller satellite. And, and that helps us make things a little more efficient, a little more affordable. Um, and and so you, you think about these problems and then you have a whole simulation pipeline that you need to be developing them in. Um, so you you build your physics models and you develop your software and you run your software against your physics models and it all breaks and it all goes to chaos and you make your software better. Uh, and there's a lot of iteration and there's a lot of testing and there's a lot of development. And we have a great team that's doing a lot of that work. Um, and we have the software running, uh, even running on board satellite hardware and showing that we can run it in real time. And so we're, we're excited about the progress and, uh, and the hope is that this allows us to help really enable satellite servicing at scale because a lot of our proximity operations and docking technologies, both the software and the hardware to a certain degree, allow us to do this in a, in a smaller yet still fully capable satellite. And this is probably a stupid question, but just confirm, and in sort of a, I assume, a fully autonomous way. And I'm, I'm asking that because I was asking about state of the art before, right? And I remember when I was back at Space University, we were seeing these um, you know movies of like astronaut training and people literally training with a joystick to dock to the ISS. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. We're like, we're like in that was, 20, <laughs> 2018 or so. So I assume your system and other people's systems would be at these days, hopefully fully autonomous. Yes, fully autonomous. Um, astronauts, there are some things that you got to send astronauts astronauts too, particularly because sometimes the goal is getting astronauts to those places. Uh, but there are a lot of things that computers can do better than humans and computers can do, especially in really dangerous environments like space, uh, more affordably and much safer than humans. Um, and so uh, you put, you, you don't want to fly people with it. You want to do it all with machines. Uh, and then the other thing that's central to it is more and more you want to do these things autonomously. And so you don't want even a human on the ground flying this with a joystick because you have communications delays mm -hmm. and communications outages and it can be hard to scale. And frankly, uh, I can very easily set my dinky little phone on a setting that beats me in chess every single time because the phone is better at chess than I am. And a lot of times now, software is going to be better than humans at the calculations and the predictions and the decision making and the steering that's necessary to, say, dock two satellites together. Uh, yeah. Early on in the process, as you're building up the heritage, you sometimes still want uh, extra checks in a loop, which can involve a human. Um, but, but yeah, highly autonomous vehicles can do things cheaper and safer and and just plain old better yeah and another aspect i guess of so related technology you mentioned that sort of like you know smaller size um can you give us a hint sort of like what what kind of size are we talking about here how big is your vehicle we're in the range of an espa class satellite okay gotcha okay cool and then i think you mentioned your propulsion is going to be electric uh we do have uh, uh electric propulsion on board the otter um and that's an important that's an important part of trying to build an efficient and affordable vehicle uh just the specific impulse that you get with electric propulsion is uh, is tremendous. And you got to take advantage of it when you're doing that end of life servicing where sometimes you're a little less sensitive to immediate timelines and you're more sensitive to how efficiently are we using our propulsion. I was going to ask, so, so obviously is is much less um, thrust than chemical propulsion, but it sounds like for the two use cases you have, it, the that the electric propulsion actually is is sufficient or even the appropriate technology. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's uh, because we're at the end of life. Timelines can be less important, and efficiency can be more important. There are other times where that's not true, and folks might value chemical thrusters or even explore other types of higher thrust thrusters. <laughs> and I know that as people look at the OTV landscape and yeah. trying to deliver satellites to orbit for them, that propulsion device can become a a key piece of technology. And you see people with uh, tremendous propulsion knowledge and uh, knowledge and heritage uh, working to develop some of these OTV companies because it can be so important for them. But um, for us, you can use a, a off-the-shelf Hall thruster, and that 
and you're not going to be very sensitive to the timeline and it's going to perform uh, very well from an efficiency perspective. Yeah, and, and just for listeners who may not know, OTV, orbital transfer vehicle, basically ah, taking yes. you from one place to another. Yes. And, and yeah, typically you want to be doing this quickly because time is literally money, money in this. And so for the various things you guys have to do and like testing out the various parts of technology stack until you then ultimately have a full vehicle, what, what are your milestones? What's your timeline? What what have you done so far? And what are sort of the next um, key milestones? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's terrestrial simulation and testing, and then there's on orbit testing, um, and then you're ready for a full vehicle. And, uh, um, and we have more that we're going to announce soon, but we can't announce it yet around mm -hmm. some of the next phase of testing for us. But I'll say a lot of our current testing has been terrestrial testing and so you build these things up in uh, for your software you build it up in a simulated physics environment and you start with a single run and you add fidelity to your simulations and you also add um, uncertainties and dispersions to your simulations and you run them in large Monte Carlos uh, which is where you might do um, hundreds or even thousands of runs to see okay well what what are the things what are the odd cases that happen that we need to now have the software be able to handle um, and then for hardware we, we do are testing in a lot of uh, terrestrial environments, simulating the best you can what conditions are going to be like in space. So maybe trying to put it in environments where you have very little friction to represent some of the dynamics that you're going to see, or putting it in a, uh, a vacuum chamber, or putting it in the thermal environments that represent what you'll see on orbit. And so we, uh, as you'd imagine, take our hardware through a lot of that testing. Gotcha. And so if you look out the timeline, assuming all goes well, um, you know, sort of vision wise, oh. yeah, if you if we're talking, I don't know what the right time frame is, sort of like, you know, end of the dec decade, if, if all goes well, like, where would you ideally like um, Starfish to be? Uh, so if we're thinking about end of the decade, um, then... It and, and then this is this is by the way, Raphael. This is a scenario where everything goes well. Sure. And you have to remember, as a startup, that um, much more likely is the scenario where things don't go well, and you look at the end of the decade and Starfish Space doesn't exist. Yeah, sure. But you uh, can't work towards that. I mean, you entrepreneur, you have to be the optimist. Yeah. Right? Much like you... as me as a venture capitalist, you have to be the optimist. <laughs> what's, the best, what's the best possible outcome, and how how do we maximize the chance it's going to happen? Yeah, that's the outcome that's worth thinking about. That's the outcome that's your that you're working towards. And and you know, that's why you would invest or we would try to work towards it is is because of what that outcome could be. Um, and as you look at the end of the decade, uh, you know, one, we're going to have to focus on developing the otter and making the otter be successful and provide value to customers. And that's something that um, is going to be the focus for several years still. Uh, and as you get to the end of the decade, I think you can say, well, look at this. There are dozens of otters operating on orbit, providing value, doing life extension, doing uh, debris removal. And now it's time to take some of these rendezvous proximity operations and docking technologies and satellite servicing technologies. And let's go see what's the next generation of mission that we can apply them to as we work to develop a new paradigm for how humans go out into the universe. Gotcha. And so all of that, obviously, I mean, yours is a hardware business, so it takes money. Um, you won't have a lot of <laughs> time today to kind of go into the depths of sort of like, you know, financing and the fundraising experience. But one aspect I did want to ask about is, um, you know, the whole sort of like on um, on orbit servicing, satellite servicing, it ha it seems to be something that's also on the mind of various parts of um, the government. Um, has mm -hmm. that been something that's been, you guys have explored? Has it been helpful? How has been, if so, how has been the experience with that? Yeah, it's definitely a mission that provides a lot of value to to governments. Governments have a lot of, of satellites. The life extension and the debris removal are very useful for them. And sometimes have governments have some other ideas for how it can be useful. Um, we do work with the U.S. government. We uh, most notably and publicly won a uh, Space Force pitch day contract uh, late last year. That was $1.7 million to work with the Space Force to help develop some of our proximity operations technology. Um, we, we work with folks like NASA, the Air Force, Space Force, in other ways also. Uh, it has, uh, it, it's, 
it's been good so far. I'll give a shout out to the AFWORKS program that the Air Force runs and now the SpaceWorks mm -hmm. program that the Space Force is standing up. They do a really good job of trying to get entrepreneurs and companies into the systems as they're developing what, what we call dual use technologies that can apply to both a commercial and to a government use. Um, those have been great programs to get onboarded into and uh, and we've gotten a chance to A, get some non-dilutive capital, but B, get to know some of the experts in these organizations and get to know some of the potential future customers and organizations. And there's a lot of great learning and a lot of great support that comes from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And so let me ask you some of the questions we, we always ask so as towards the end of the podcast. Um, are you guys hiring right now? We are doing a little bit of hiring. Okay, cool. So we'll put the um, we'll put a link to your website and in the show notes. because Yeah, that would be awesome. Of our, um, to some of our listeners and, and we increasingly hear from space companies also that hiring has become a bottleneck for many people. So we're trying to you know help out with that as well. And um, the other question I always like to ask is, so you have explained, you know, why you're doing Starfish and all of this, but you obviously sort of, by virtue of where you were, um, the origin and all of that, you're very aware of what's going on in space in general. Mm -hmm. If you weren't doing Starfish, is there something compelling you would immediately think of that, oh, you know, um, if I had um, if I had the time, I would do this as a business opportunity, I mean. <laughs> um, boy, Raphael, it's hard to come up with one mediocre <laughs> idea. I don't know if I can come up with two. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, satellite servicing is incredibly exciting and I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, there are some things that, uh, you know, I don't know if the... Artemis program in the U.S. is is really getting the momentum in in quite the way that I think many of us hope it it would or hope that it someday does. But um, but that's incredibly exciting. And I think as you think about space, there's obviously space for uh, business purposes and providing value to people. And and sometimes I think space can provide value to people in just a uh, a discovery and a wonder and an ability to bring people together around a common goal that um, that can be hard to sort of recognize in the markets. And I think that a well done Artemis program could do that. Um, and and that would be something that would be awesome to be a part of. Um, I if we're talking about on the business side, you know, at the at the core, I think one of the ways that people, well, there's always a chase of how do you use space to provide value to humans. And in many ways at Starfish Space, we are providing value to other space companies that then provide value to humans. Human. Um, yeah. And the people who have ideas for how do you provide value directly to humans. And I think a lot of these folks are constellation operators. Yeah. Um, and then there are some folks out there that are looking at some of the like early stages of manufacturing in space. Yeah. Um, and I think those are, are very interesting because as people really unlock things that do provide value to humans, that's where you have um, incredible potential to, to move the lever in, in how people use space. Yeah, exactly. And how people, the broad public thinks about space and really understanding its use. Yeah. And I guess some of the, are, well, your your core technology, I guess we talked about sort of the the, the, the rendezvous proximity of stock and RPOD technology. And one could imagine like, you know, in some hopefully not too far future, we have a bunch of, you know, space stations as an all proposed under the NASA CLD program. People do manufacturing, uh, spacecraft sort of autonomously dock, bring materials, take materials away again. And some of the stuff you guys are working on could become very, very relevant and essential for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. But uh, you mentioned Artemis and the moon and everything. So let's segue into our traditional final question, which is about science fiction. Do you, do you like science fiction? And if so, what kind of science fiction? Uh, I love science fiction. Um, the I'll say my favorite piece of science fiction is uh, I love Star Trek The Next Generation. Mm. Uh, I, I watched it a lot uh, growing up, and now I have what, all the various DVDs, and I don't know whether it's still on Netflix or not. But, uh, mm -hmm. but to me, that represents... Uh, that's the future that you want to build. And I think that that's a future that you want to build from a technology standpoint. And, and in many ways, Star Trek can show a future that you want to build from a society standpoint. And, uh, and boy, I want to, I would love to be sitting on the bridge of the enterprise with the crew, great people exploring our galaxy and, and seeing what's out there. Uh, maybe, maybe we're all a little too early for that, Raphael, but uh, we can work towards it. 
We can work towards, yeah. And we all want things like the the replicator and the and the transporter <laughs> to be more also. Yeah, sure. if I could just get my Earl Grey tea hot whenever I wanted it, then you'd really be having something. <laughs> there you go. Well, Austin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, let me say good luck to you guys in, in outer space. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it, Raphael. Always a pleasure. Uh, and I'm sure we'll catch up soon. So we we'll certainly do. Thank you. All the best. Always Sorry. a pleasure, Raphael. Right. I'll see you. Okay. And that's a wrap for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. Once more, if you enjoyed this, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. You can support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, and that may include yourself if you have an interesting space story to tell, or interested in being a sponsor, drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. See you for the next episode.